924 Gilman Street, the best thing the Bay Area punk movement had experienced in the 1980s, the best community those kids had experienced in their whole life. We saw how this historic venue came to be, we talked about its best features, we saw some of its problems, but let's get real, those were just minor nuisances. Today we're talking about two moments that threatened to shatter 924 Gilman Street for good. We're telling the story of how East Bay punks fought to keep their home together, paving the way for a new Gilman Street era. Hello top patterns and newcomers, this is Simon Mas, your friend with a master degree in music and… well, perhaps the wrong attire to talk about punk? No time for a change of clothes though, it's time to delve into the battle for Gilman Street. Skinheads had always been a pain in the Bay Area. They had taken over the hardcore scene to mess with people and beat them up, mostly to relieve their frustration at being considered outcasts and losers. It's no surprise that Gilman Street soon attracted their attention to. Founders Tim Yohannan's policies of non-violence and inclusion had effectively kept them out for a while. But as the club grew and bands started relocating from out of state to be part of that scene, skinheads grew too, devolving to be more intransigent, xenophobic and violent sleazy bags. He made it sound sleazy! It is sleazy! And now they saw Gilman Street as the home of the enemy. The younger, goody two shoes, straight as punk freaks, they wanted to humiliate. Sometimes they would arrive in droves, bashing through the security and starting fights to ruin the evening for everyone else. The situation was volatile. Some Gilman people wanted to show the merits of non violence to avoid further repercussions, but punks coming from out of town wanted to fight back. Hailing from more conservative states than California, they did not want to put up with the same nonsense they faced at home. And some locals, including Tim Yohannan, agreed with them. In the end, they got their way. One night, a monster truck stopped in front of Gilman, the engine revving, the truck full of skins, all shouting angrily, they were looking for vengeance. A Gilman band had played a song ridiculing them, time to bash some heads, the skins thought. But as they jumped off the monster truck and approached the venue's main door, something unexpected happened. The Gilman crowd started coming out to meet them. High school and university kids armed with baseball bats, tools, chains, whatever they could find. As the skinheads paused in surprise, this had never happened before. The punks launched their attack and started beating them up. This was not how the skins had pictured the evening to go down. Soon they did what bullies always do when they don't outnumber their prey. they ran away as fast as they could. As the dust settled all the troublemakers were gone and they never came back. This must have been a huge injection of confidence for the Gilman Street crowd. Some of those people had been put down all their lives, mocked and bullied in school, beaten up by jocks, fascists, sometimes even by their parents, cast as misfits and losers for being different. Now they had finally stood up for the right of being left alone and they had won. But the excitement of this victory didn't linger for long. A few weeks later, on the 11th of September 1988, people found the doors of Gilman closed. A passive aggressive note was taped on those doors. Gilman Street Project is now closed permanently due to lack of the creative juices necessary to make it worthwhile. Apathy and taking Gilman for granted have led to a consumerist attitude. 
we've learned a lot, met a lot of great people, and hope to work together in other ways. Bye! Tim Johannan and the Maximum Rock and Roll people had decided to close the club. Why? There had been problems with people going out of the club to get drunk or stoned and then walk back in, so that the no alcohol or drugs rule was technically respected. There was the skinhead threat. There were people peddling fascist or racist ideas to the younger crowd, and the jock had sued Gilman for $16,000 after getting hurt from his stage diving stunt, and he had won the case. You are joking, right? The pressure of creating a monthly magazine and a weekly radio show, the work needed to put on at least two articulate and stimulating shows per week at the club, and running it. Johanan and co. probably felt they were getting too much aggro and too little support from their community, and I can sympathize with them. Unlike Johanan, I have you. People who know that supporting this channel and my videos with reactions and comments help me understand how I can give you even better videos. Perhaps you'll consider subscribing to my Telegram channel for free extras and a monthly recap of my work? Link in the description or with this QR code. Or maybe you'll feel generous enough to send me a small PayPal donation or a large one for that matter. Thank you, and let's go back to our story. The closing of Gilman was a slap in the face for the whole community. Less than two years from its opening, it was already all over? No way, Jose. Well, some of the younger volunteers still had the keys to open the place up, and many others rushed to organize and launch a new 924 Gilman Street in record time. Same spirit, same rules, almost the same people. Maybe it was the injection of self-esteem coming from defeating the skinheads, and maybe that place had become more than just a club to attend events, it had become a home. Whatever the case, the new Gilman kept the old spirit going. It was a battle of a kind, the old guard kept on the fringe, waiting for the kids to fall on their face and Gilman Street to implode. In fact, just like its predecessor, the club prospered. You could tell it was slightly different than what it used to be if you were an old-timer, but in the end, Johannan himself had to agree that the new management was working well and producing great events and a positive community. It would be wrong to say that Gilman quickly regained its status as the epicenter of East Bay Punk, but just because the new era came in so quickly that Gilman never lost that status to begin with. On the other hand, in just a couple of years, this new era ended too, with one incredible success and with divisions and controversies. But that's a story for another time. The story of the battle for Gilman Street And now. This, my dear Top Patters, was Simon Mas. Stick around for more music-related videos and for the Green Day series that will unveil how the second Gilman Street era ended. For the moment, stay cool and keep your top hat on. Bye!